um, for the many valuable lessons that we can learn through reading it. So we pray for Andy as he leads the study. We pray, Lord, that you would help him to lead it in such a way that we might take on board what you're saying to us. And we pray also, Heavenly Father, that your word may be edifying to each and every one of us tonight, that you would help us in our walk with Jesus, that you would help us to build on our faith and help us, Heavenly Father, to trust you more and to love you more. And so we just thank you for each and every one in this group tonight. We pray your bless our fellowship together, although we are separated, although we have to do this online. We do thank you, Lord, uh, for what we have in common through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just appreciate so much that we're able to come together as your people, as your family. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, just going to read the first 10 verses. That's what we're looking at this evening. So this is what Paul writes. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to the to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we said, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to your gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For now, sorry, for I am now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Amen. Oh, God blessing coming in as well. Um, so. I'm hoping that as we go through this little series, um, that the gospel will really refresh your heart. I say that because it's um, it's easy in the Christian life to add things to the gospel message and our walk with God. Um, I think it's easy to be like the Pharisees who outwardly did all the right things, went through all the motions. And yet their, their hearts were very much far away from God. Um, if you think about who the Pharisees were, they were religious guys who thought that their good works would make them right and holy before God. Uh, they thought that being religious made them better than anyone else. Um, and that can be like us, can't it? So often. Um, one In one way or another, as one person I wrote this, as one person I read this week said, we're all recovering Pharisees. I quite like that. We're all recovering Pharisees. What he means is that we all have a, a tendency to think that our own good works get us into heaven. Or we all have a kind of tendency to think that we're better than anyone else or everyone else. Um, and it's easy to think, oh, I'm doing okay here because I'm doing all the outward things. And yet inwardly, we can be quite far away from God. I don't know if you feel that, but I do um, um, a lot of the time. And so we need to be reminded in this book about what the gospel is and what the good news is for our, for our souls. Because when we remember that, it humbles us. When we remember that, it helps us to praise God who deserves all the glory and it also um, keeps us close to the Lord Jesus Christ and keeps our hearts um, affectionate towards him. He alone makes us right before God this evening. And that's why I want us to want to drum home from not just the opening text, but hopefully this whole book, because that's what Paul does. <laughs> Paul just drums it again and again, the same thing. You are not made right with God through good works. You are made right with God through faith in Christ. And that's really important that we understand that because as we're going to see a little bit later on, there's lots of different false gospels out there that take us away. Some that are taught from other people, some that we just naturally 
lean towards us in our sin. And so we need to remember that over and over again. Um, if you want a key verse for the whole book, I think Galatians 2 uh, verse 16 um, is kind of a, a centerpiece of the whole thing. I was read it. It says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have been believed so we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. That's a really key verse in the whole book. So you can underline that and we'll, we'll hit that when we get there. So first question for you guys is a very simple one. You can't get this wrong. Who is writing this letter? Paul. <laughs> well done, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is writing this letter. Now, did you notice as well um, who the letter is backed up by in verse two? Brothers and sisters. Exactly, I mean, brothers and sisters. So this is a, a letter written by Paul, but it's also backed up by um, brothers and sisters in Christ who are around Paul. Um, so obviously the message um, or what's happening in Galatia has got back to not just Paul, but other churches. And so this, this, this letter was written by Paul, but um, it's backed up by um, many believers. Okay. Next question. Another simple one. How does Paul introduce himself in verse one? What does he tell us about himself? They were sent by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? God the Father. Yeah. And what's his title? He's an apostle. He's an apostle. Yeah, exactly. So this is really, really important um, that he says this in the opening verse. Paul an apostle um so what does that mean that he's an apostle okay so an apostle simply translates as sent one and basically in the ancient world an apostle was an official official messenger or ambassador usually for someone who's important so for example if i wanted to send a message to derek and bingham but i didn't want to go over and see him i, could, I didn't have any emails or anything like we do now I could send an apostle, a messenger. The messenger would go over and tell Derek and Anne, come round to dinner tomorrow night, five o'clock. And that message is certified because it's, it's I've, been, I've sent the person to, to Derek to give the message. And so the messenger and the messenger had the authority of the sender, in this case, me. So whatever the messenger has said to Derek and Anne, that has authority with it because I've sent that person. In the New Testament, um, when the word apostle is mentioned, it means a spokesperson for Jesus Christ. A spokesperson for Jesus Christ. So the apostles were called, they were chosen, and they were commissioned specifically by Jesus Christ. And when we're talking about apostle here, we're talking about a big A apostle, not a little A apostle. Um, we're talking about a big A apostle. Um, and Paul specifically points this out because people were questioning his apostleship they were questioning his apostleship they were saying that he was a second-rate apostle and the reason they were devaluing his apostleship is because they were questioning the message that he brought the people in galatia so if you can um, understand the trajectory if he's not really an apostle then they don't have to listen to his message if he is an apostle from jesus christ then his message is authority and they can't change it. So it's really important. Um, and so what's at stake here is not just Paul's apostleship, but the very message that he brought to people in Galatia. And that same message is the message that we've believed as well. So what's on the line here is our salvation. So if he's not really an apostle of Jesus Christ, then the message he's brought is a fake 
and what we believed in as a fake as well. And so one of the things in his letter that we'll see is that he'll go back to this again and again. He'll, he'll, he'll give his credentials, if you like, that he's an apostle just as much as anyone else is, uh, just as much as any of the other apostles were who spent time with Jesus. Uh, now, one of the reasons that they were questioning his apostleship was because he was chosen later on, if you remember. He wasn't one of the original apostles who spent time with Jesus. Um, and we find out his meeting with Jesus in Acts 9. If you want to turn there just briefly, uh, keep your hand in Galatians and just turn over to Acts 9. Famous account, but let's just read it anyway. Um, whoever gets there and feels confident to read, just want to read the first five verses. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Thanks, Irene. It's perfect. So here we have just that famous encounter where, where Paul meets Christ, or Christ, meet, Christ meets Paul. Um, and he has this flash from, of light from the sky, and Jesus is like, why are you, why are you persecuting me? Um, and this is Paul's encounter with the risen Christ. And later on, Jesus will commission him for a specific ministry, which is to the Gentiles. Um, he had a specific ministry to the Gentiles, and that's um, how we get a lot of the book of Acts and uh, the letters that we have in, in, in the Bible. So basically, what Paul is saying in verse one, and Irene pointed out to us earlier, this is not through men. This is through Jesus Christ and God the Father who, uh, who raised him from the dead. So the message he has is backed by divine authority. And as I said, if it's backed by divine authority, if you reject the message, you reject Christ himself. That's what Paul's saying here. Reject the message, you reject Christ himself reject Paul's apostleship you reject reject Christ himself okay that's why he says in verse one um those things um who's he writing to in, in this letter churches in Galatia churches in Galatia uh anyone know where in the world that is yeah it's in Turkey yeah there you go. Another bonus point for Derek. <laughs> it's, it's in Turkey, modern day Turkey. So it's in a place 2000 years ago, it was called Asia Minor. And one of the, some of the places that Paul visited were uh, places like Antioch, uh, Lystra, Derby, and other places, Iconium. Uh, and so that's modern day, modern day Turkey. That's where he's writing to. Sure, yeah. So next question, doing well guys, 10 out of 10 so far. Uh, what's the tone of this introduction in the first 10 verses? How, how do you think Paul's feeling? What kind of words is he using? Well, he says astonished. He's astonished, yeah. So. Astonished in a good way, you think? No, because they're they're deserting him, they're deserting Jesus. Yeah, yeah, he's astonished. Yeah. Anything else we can see in the text, or some things that are missing in the text as well? I think he was upset about what was happening, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. amongst, amongst the Galatian Christians. Yeah. They had heard the gospel and now they were turning away from the gospel as he had taught it. Yeah. 
upset is an understatement. <laughs> he's, he's absolutely, yeah, he's agitated. <laughs> he's, he's agitated. Well, we're, 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 we're Scottish, Andy, we just get upset. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your eyebrows a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, he's agitated, definitely. Um, one one commentator said it like this: "A storm is brewing. A storm is brewing." As he as he as he opens up this introduction to the book, um, he's very short in these opening verses. And notice in particular what is missing. What is missing is the pleasantries. So usually, if you look at Paul's letters, you have a little bit of thanksgiving for the. The believers, even when he writes to the Corinthians, he has uh, three or four verses where he's thanking God for them, even though they're bang at it in the background. But here he just moves some introduction, grace and peace to you, right into things. So you can tell, you know, when you're writing a letter to someone um, or an email, sorry, you don't really write letters anymore, email. Uh, but when you're writing an email to someone and you, you're writing a nice email, you usually have a nice, uh, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. How's your day? Blah, blah, blah. And then you get into things. But if you're angry with someone, don't you? You're like, hi, Anna, what's going on? Uh, or whatever. You just go straight into it, don't you? you? You can tell the mood of someone by the way that they write, don't, can't you? And it's the same here. Um, he's very short with them. He's very much right into things. And uh, we find out why in verses six to nine to get straight down to business. So why is Paul writing this letter? Um, six to nine, six to 10. Because they're moving away from his original message. Exactly, yeah. They're moving away from the message that he had preached to them in the beginning. And he uses very strong language. If you notice, verse six says, I'm astonished, um, gobsmacked, that you are deserting. I don't know what it says in your translation, but it's a deserting in my translation, deserting the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel. So he's using language of treachery there, isn't he? Um, if you like, and a ditching the one who called them. He di they're ditching the one that died for them, Jesus Christ. And they're rejecting the God who had saved them. Um, and so, strong language here. <laughs> you're deserting the one that saved you, is pretty much what he's saying. And you're turning to a different gospel, which is actually, verse 7, no gospel at all, because there's only one gospel, isn't there? Mm. Um. So what is the teaching that they're, they're turning to and who, who's teaching it? Well, verse seven um, begins to just unravel it a little bit for us. I'll read it out again. Verse seven says, not there's another one, another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So there's obviously some troublemakers who are distorting um, the gospel. And you think about distortion, like if you distort something like a picture, um, you know, you do, you have these, don't you, on um, on quiz shows when they distort the picture quite slightly so you can't see who the celebrity is and you've got to try and guess who it is. Um, but here they're distorting it in a way that's negative so that you, then, then they're not understanding the gospel anymore. They're moving away from the, tr the teaching of Paul as, um, as Joe um, rightly said earlier. So who are these troublemakers? Just turn with me to Acts 15 verse 1. We find out who these who these guys are that Paul is talking about. Acts 15, verse 1. Again, if anyone's brave enough to read that verse, that'd be great. Okay, I'll read it. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, so what, what were they teaching? That you needed circumcision. Yeah, exactly, yeah, according to the custom of, of Moses. So 
These men were called either the Judaizers or the circumcision party. And they were teaching that Jesus is the Christ. They believed that. But to be a proper follower, you had to follow the Mosaic law as well. So they were teaching new Christians had to be circumcised. New Christians had to hold to the, the um, ceremonial laws of washing your hands, all that kind of stuff. And it was set out in Leviticus and um, the eating clean or unclean food, all that kind of stuff. You had, to, you had to still adhere to the Old Testament laws, which Paul had taught were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one very dead dude said this about 1500 years ago. And he said, put it this way, the Galatians are going astray because they're adding Judaism to the gospel of faith in Christ. And the Galatians are going astray because they're adding Judaism to the gospel of faith in Christ. Um, disturbed by these tendency, Paul writes this letter in order they may preserve faith in Christ alone. Now, we might think, what's the big deal, Paul? What's the big deal if they do this and a little bit of that? I mean, they believe in Jesus. You know, who cares if they have to do a few, jump through a few more, more hoops? What's the big deal? That's probably what the Galatians were thinking um, beforehand as well, before they received this letter. They probably thought what these guys are teaching doesn't sound too different to what Paul had, had told them. Um, it was hard for these new Christians because a lot of them had Jewish backgrounds. And so it sounded plausible to them that they should believe in Christ <laughs> and, and still follow the Old Testament law. Um, however, notice, again, how serious Paul is in these verses. Um, the language he uses is like astonished. He's so, he's so angry with these false teachers. He uses words, words like they're perverting the truth. They're distorting the truth. These guys are troublemakers. These, these guys are cursed. They're doomed. Um, and so what Paul is trying to do in these opening verses before he, he gets into the, the meat of the message later on, is, is to see, get the Galatian Christians to see how serious this is, turning to a different gospel. And he's like, he's like a child, he's like me with Ezra or Isaac, trying to help them understand how dangerous it is for them to cross the road by themselves. They didn't understand it. Ezra, if I just let him go, just walk across the road. He wouldn't even think twice about it. He doesn't understand the danger of the road. I've got to sit down and, and tell him that and show him why it's so dangerous that you could get him killed. Well, that's the same kind of thing that Paul's doing here. He wants, to, he wants them to see how dangerous and how serious this issue is. Uh, and what he says in these opening verses is that the salvation of our souls is at stake. The very glory of God is in disrepute. Uh, and there's nothing more serious than this false teaching and moving them away from the gospel. Um, like I said, their salvation, our salvation is um is at stake think about it like this in this way think about the gospel like an a cold refreshing drink on a hot day when you drink the gospel it refreshes your soul it, it saves it it saves it and transforms it how what would happen if you took that drink on a hot day and you you put a few drops of poison in put a few drops of poison into the drink and you drank it firstly it probably wouldn't taste very nice but secondly, it would kill you, wouldn't it? And that's exactly what uh, Paul is saying here. You might drop, put a few drops of extra stuff on, but when you do that, you make a deadly message. <laughs> and that's what the false teachers were doing. They were adding to the gospel in such a way that it ruined it. And those who were drinking it were spiritually harming themselves. And that's what Paul was trying to get across in this, in this whole letter. So how does Paul tackle this issue in the in the first few verses um, and we'll end with this before I ask a few questions obviously he's angry and he, and, re, and he rebukes them but he also if you notice in verses three and four he just reminds them and he reminds us as he begins this letter what the gospel is you see that grace to you and peace from God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father, God and Father, our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the first thing he says here is Jesus Christ gave himself. Jesus Christ gave himself for us. 
Um, see that in verse in verse four, he gave himself for us. Jesus Christ willingly came into this diseased world, um, this sin ravaged world from heaven. He lived a perfect life we could not live. And he obeyed his father in heaven and he went to the cross. He willingly gave himself up for us. As he says in John 10, no one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own accord. It was, he submitted to God the Father and he went to the cross and laid down his life for us. And secondly, why did he do that? Well, he says there, he gave himself for our sins. He died for our sins. He died what is called a substitutionary death on the cross. We deserve the punishment for our sins, but instead Christ took our place. He drank the bitter cup of God's wrath. He paid for all our sins by his precious blood. And one, one guy put it like this. He gathered up all our sins and he put them on his shoulders and he paid for them with his death. Gathered up all our sins, past, present, future. He put them on his shoulders. He walked them to the cross. And he died from there and they're dead. They're gone when we trust in Christ. Every single sin of yours has been nailed to the cross. So the second thing he says, and the third thing he says is that he's rescued us from this present evil age. Uh, in other words, the gospel is a rescue package for us. We were spiritual prisoners, imprisoned to our sinful flesh, imprisoned to Satan, we're imprisoned to the world that's passing away, this present evil age. And yet Christ has, has freed us from that prison. And in particular, Paul emphasizes just in verse four, the corruption of this present evil age. Uh, and in other words, what he's saying here is that Christ broke into our lives. And uh, when we trusted in Christ, we received a small glimpse of the new age to come, uh, where there will be a perfect um, earth as we have heaven on earth here, here, right? Um, sorry, where we have a perfect heaven here on earth. And just notice in those verses, we are not mentioned. <laughs> We're not mentioned. The Galatians aren't mentioned. We're not mentioned in, in the gospel message. It's not like it says, God the Father came up for the plan, Christ executed it, and then Joe Lamont has done something. <laughs> Or, or Gillian has done something, or, or Derek's done something, or, or any of us, we're not mentioned in those verses. This is about, the gospel is about what God has done for us. We didn't plan it, we didn't execute it, we didn't rescue ourselves. We are simply helpless sinners who need the grace of God. And what Paul is most concerned about here in this, in this whole book, and it's a concern of the Holy Spirit from the whole Bible, is the glory of God. If you look at verse five, to whom be the glory forever and ever. That's what he's concerned about most. And these false teachers were robbing God of the glory that he alone deserves. God the Father plans our salvation. God the Son willingly died for our sins. And the Spirit of God applies the work of God the Father and God the Son to our hearts. And so as Christians... We have nothing to boast about. And also as Christians, we do not have to work for our salvation in any way, shape or form. And so all glory goes to God. If we had something to do with our salvation, we could pat ourselves on the back <laughs> and we could receive some glory. But that's not the way it works. That's not how the way, that's not how the Bible presents things. And so this letter is about the gospel. It's about our salvation. It's about the glory of God. And Paul is very clear here, isn't he? Anyone who preaches a different gospel is accursed. They're doomed. Anyone who preaches a different gospel to the true apostolic word of the New Testament is false. They are wronged. They're wrong. They're cursed. They're doomed. And if you drink it, it is unhealthy for your soul and could, could lead you to everlasting punishment. Um, there's only one gospel. That's what Paul's going to say again and again. The one preached by Jesus Christ and passed on to the apostles. Gospel is this. We were foolish, miserable, selfish sinners. 
and Christ saved us, not by works, but by grace. And we're made righteous before God through faith in Jesus Christ. Don't work for our salvation. It's a work of God from start to finish. And we'll be praising God for his great salvation to us for eternity. So here's a couple of bits of application as we end, and I've got a couple of questions we want to answer them. So hopefully from this book, we'll understand, again, the need to understand the gospel and to preach it to ourselves. I'm hoping that from this book, and the gospel will humble us, and it will cause us to praise God. Um, as um, a guy writes called Hendrickson, so marvelous is the work of the son that he's worthy of never ending praise. So marvelous, so wonderful is the work of the son that he's worthy of never ending praise. And so I hope this gospel, this book, will also not just humble us, but cause us to praise God. And also I hope this book will help us watch out for, for false teaching and for false gospels. There's so many out there. There's the, the gospel of, if you believe in Christ, you will have material possessions, the prosperity gospel. Um, there's the um, gospel of Jesus Christ that I'll be personally fulfilled in my life. There's the gospel of um, if I do X, Y, X, Y, and Z in my life, God will love me more and I'll be a better Christian. These are all false gospels and they can easily slip into, into our hearts. So I've got some questions. Any questions for me from that text or any comments people want to make before I ask a couple of questions and we'll pray to end. Yeah, that was a good idea. And it, it's something I've been thinking a lot about recently because I, I, I've heard the gospel preached probably unintentionally, but preached in a wrong way. And, and I'm sure their intentions weren't to teach it in a wrong way. But it's so easy to do that. You've got to watch language and you've got to be very careful in the way the gospel is for, haven't you? I mean, the Judaizers, they knew what they were 